Welcome everybody to a special edition of All In with Art Stapleton, a New York Giants podcast brought to you by NorthJersey.com and The Record. And we are live from MetLife Stadium, the Giants draft party. I am your host, Art Stapleton. I've got John Schmelk, Giants Huddle Podcast, Giants pre and post game radio, and draft guru, Schmelk, <laughs> Not thanks quite. for joining me. Uh, Happy to be here, Art. Everyone watching on the North Jersey YouTube page, thank you for watching. And we'll have an audio podcast out later. But let's get right into it. We've got a Giants guest coming up soon. Uh, Bobby Okereke is supposed to join us. He's here. We'll uh, catch up with Bobby for about five, six minutes uh, and let him go on his way tonight. John, let's dive into it. Giants at six. A lot of speculation, a lot of reporting being done over the last two days. Your gut feeling now, we are about two hours from the start of the draft and about three hours from when the Giants are supposed to go on at number six. What are you feeling as far as what's going on right now? Well, I think the frustrating thing for Giant fans is the Giants could want to make a move here. They might have a player in mind they want to get. And they could offer everything under the sun, including the stadium that we're sitting in right now. And it's completely out of their control whether the team that's sitting above them is going to take that deal. Yeah, that's, that's 100% true. Now, the latest I've been hearing, you know, obviously the Patriots, to me, my gut tells me if the Patriots were dead set on taking Drake May, you wouldn't have seen all those reports from New England, Tom Curran, Mike Reese, that, you know, the Patriots are going to take Drake May, but they're open to the godfather offer of making us an offer you can't refuse. You know, you, the Bears aren't taking offers for Caleb Williams. That's not happening. So what I think is when the F Patriots are on the clock, as long as the first two picks go, Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels to Washington, I think that's when you're going to talk about Elliot Wolf and Joe Shane being on the phone. Now, I'm sure Elliot Wolf will be with Quazy up in Minnesota on the phone as well, talking about Drake May. But I think that's when you're going to get Joe Shane's best deal. And I think what you're looking at is the 2025 first round pick. It has to start there. It has to start with number six, probably the second rounder this year, and then the first round or next year, and that's the start. And will the Patriots want to squeeze more out of the Giants? And that's really, I think, where we're at right now. See, I think the internal dynamics of the Patriots art is what's really interesting to me here, right? Because Elliot Wolf might be playing this game to try to get the best offer when they're on the clock, the same way Monty Ossenfort's apparently doing that in Arizona, right? Because he not only has to get a deal that he wants to do, he has to get a deal good enough to convince Robert Kraft to okay the trade. Yeah. Because anything you do in an organization involving your franchise quarterback goes through ownership for every single team in the league. John Mara's been very clear. He's going to let Joe Shane do whatever he wants. So he already has the okay, you're good to go. Robert Kraft lived through 15 years of Tom Brady, which was probably the best 15 years of his professional football <laughs> life. Yeah. The last few years, not as good. No. So I think whether or not he can convince him to trade out of a quarterback, which is what you have to assume you're doing, even if you're going to six, because maybe the Vikings want to move up to, to, to five. Maybe the Broncos want to move up to four. Who knows? Or the Patriots maybe could figure out a secondary deal, move down to six, then slide back up a spot or two with the Cardinals. I think that's so, an interesting dynamic. That if the Patriots, you know, all there was all this talk a couple weeks ago. Remember when the video went out with Monty Austin yep. for it? that the, the Cardinals actually put out the video because Monty last year, it was the full Monty. It was working this deal to go back, then it was working this deal to move forward. I really think that that may happen more and more with the new age general managers. You know, Joe Shane has talked about the comfort level of being on the clock and not being afraid to be able to place those calls and have trust in who you're dealing with. Well, that's the trick, right? Does Elliot Wolf have a good enough relationship with Monty Austin for it? with Joe Ortiz in LA, which would be the two guys you're dealing with in that situation, to have an agreement that's not firm, but you have a verbal handshake, right, whatever you want to phrase it, that they have the trust factor that that's going to get done. Because if you tell the owner, yeah, we have this all set up to get the fourth quarterback and then it falls apart, guess what? Elliot Wolf's not officially the general manager. And he's right. not going to be if that's what happens. <laughs> so it, it is a very interesting dynamic with what the Patriots are thinking and how they're approaching this in terms of 
how secure they want to be in the quarterback. How much do they think Drake May is different than J.J. McCarthy on their board? Right. We don't know the answer to any of those questions. We don't know what the Giants think of Drake May versus J.J. McCarthy either. These are things that we don't know that only people in the building know when it comes to making these decisions. Now, if you check out my stories on NorthJersey.com this week, I, did, we all know what happened 20 years ago, right? I mean, it was not here. It was at the theater at Madison Square Garden. And, you know, Ernie Acorsi was the general manager, and they convinced Wellington Mara that they needed to go for a franchise quarterback. But I remember talking to Ernie, and you have too, and we all have. Ernie loves to talk. <laughs> you know, in the past, just the idea of how that trade came to be. The idea that it was seven minutes left on the clock when the Giants were on the clock, and he finally got a call back from A.J. Smith of the Chargers that said, okay, let's get ready to, to make something happen here. Uh, the Giants didn't know. I mean, Ernie, the, the bet, one of the best nuggets I got this week was the fact that Ernie, of course, he told the Giants representative at the theater in Madison Square Garden to write Ben Roethlisberger's name on the card that was going to get handed into the league. Because that was the Giants' second choice at quarterback Absolutely. after Eli. Absolutely, and right. people kind of forget that. I mean, we've told the stories, but for younger fans who weren't around, you know, following the team that closely back then, you didn't have social media back in 2004. And the reality is that the Giants were going to take Ben Roethlisberger yep. if they could not swing the deal for Eli Manning. And they ended up picking Phillip Rivers because Ernie Corsi basically was at the 11th hour and he felt like, you know what, we're close enough where we're going to take the chance. They didn't have a deal. They essentially had A.J. Smith, uh, Smith on his word that he was going to pull the trigger and make that deal. The NFL is different now. You know, now if the Giants and the Patriots make a deal or the Patriots make a deal with anyone, the deal gets announced first and then the team goes on the clock. Right. It's not, it wasn't that way back then. Eli Manning had a parade around with a Chargers hat and I had a fun story with uh, Dylan Sherwin, who was the young fan that informed Eli that he was actually traded from the Chargers to the Giants that day. Uh, and he is now 31 years old and a Jets fan but he's still an Eli Manning fan. If you haven't seen that story, check it out on NorthJersey.com. So, and, oh, and I think the second part of this thing that's interesting, right? If we push the quarterback thing aside, we'll see if they get him or not, right? If they are able to trade up. If they can't, then what happens? Because I think that's another additional interesting thing. Exactly. This is the concept of potentially trading back, which I think is unlikely, but you never know. Apparently, teams are really trying to move up into the top 10 to get some of these players. I don't think the Giants would want to trade away from one of these top four offensive weapons. I'll include Brock Bowers in that conversation with the top three receivers. And there's a scenario here where there could be no receivers off the board when the Giants pick yep. at five. If the Cardinals trade out, Vikings pick McCarthy at four, Chargers pick Joe Alt at five, you can get any one of the three receivers. There's also a scenario where the Cardinals stick and pick Harrison the, char the Chargers stick and pick neighbors, and then you only have one guy left in a Dunze. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways this can go, but I think you have to feel pretty secure if you're the Giants that if you just sit and pick, you're going to get one of those top three receivers. You know, I don't know how the Giants have them graded out. For me, they're all very, very close. They're all top eight players for me in this year's class. So I don't think that's a can't lose situation if you're a Giant fan. Every one of those wide receivers are could be the number one wide receiver or a top 10 pick in any draft class over the past 10 years. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit. First off, if you're watching now, thanks for joining us on the NorthJersey.com YouTube page. I'm Art Stapleton. This is John Schmelk from the Giants. We are here live at MetLife Stadium for the Giants draft party. Jets are on the other side. It's going to be a wild night for the Giants, mostly because of the uncertainty. And we talked about that at the top, the idea that, you know, maybe they move up to three, maybe they move up to four. We don't know how much the Giants like J.J. McCarthy. Do they like J.J. McCarthy enough to move up to four? Do they want to take a chance? I'm of the opinion that if you're going to take a quarterback and you like a guy, you can't just sit there and wait for him. As Joe Shane said last year, you like a guy, you go and get him. That's what they did with Jalen Hyatt in the third round last year. If they like him, they'll move for him. They're not just going to sit exactly. and wait for him. Correct. Uh, you know, so let's get to the receivers a little bit. Yep. I think, you know, the funny thing is, you know, nobody would have thought that Marvin Harrison Jr. would have had an opportunity to be there at six. I certainly would not have. When you and I were together at the Combine, there's no way I thought that was happening. 
But there is a scenario if the Giants are out of the quarterback mix and it goes quarterback one through four, at five, there's a lot of talk about uh, the Chargers wanting an offensive lineman. That is it Latham from Alabama? Is it Joe Alt? What will they do in that spot? And if that happens, all of a sudden Marvin Harrison is sitting there at six. I would have never anticipated that, but no. he's got to be in the top three players that the Giants have on their big board, uh, at least I would assume. You know, if you want to say, okay, the quarterbacks, whoever you have ahead of them, but it's pretty pretty crazy that they could be sitting there and have their choice of wide receivers in this class. Yeah, no, and I'll say this too. I don't think it's out of the question that – the Cardinals or Chargers have neighbors ahead of Marvin Harrison on their board either. You know, Bruce Feldman put out a great article on The Athletic a couple, a couple days ago where he talked to NFL coaches, and I think four out of the five guys had neighbors as a better wideout than Harrison. Yeah. So that's not out of the question either, where, you know, you have a player that is a little bit different than Marvin Harrison. Harrison obviously has all the pedigree. He's big. He's tall. He's, he's very uh, precise. He's very polished. But Malik Neighbors is a better player with, his, with the ball in his hands. He's special in that way. And not many people could bring that juice, and some teams might value that more than your traditional outside X receiver, which I would put Harrison and Adunze into that category. Harrison's a little bit of a better athlete to me, so I'd have him a little bit ahead of Adunze in that, in that list. It's very interesting because I, I think uh, Neighbors fits more schematically for this offense, but I think Rome Adunze might appeal to them more in terms of the whole – you know, idea of he's clean. He's a clean prospect, and it doesn't mean that the other two are, are dirty prospects in any way. <laughs> uh, but just the idea of Adunze, everybody remembers the story at the Combine. No one else worked out. Adunze worked out. He stayed after for the three-cone drill. You know, and I think it was pretty genuine. I mean, although if someone told him to do that, to stay after, he kind of made an impression on some people who were trying to judge his work ethic. He definitely checks every box from an intangible standpoint. There's, There's no, no doubt. And, no, and, no doubt. You know, I know some Giants fans have reached out to me, the idea of a Michael Penix Jr., the idea of the, that Washington combo, the idea if the Giants don't get a quarterback early, if they have Penix high enough on their board, how cool would it be to have Roma Dunze and then Michael Penix back at the end of the first round? Well, I'm not sure if that's what they're going to be thinking about, but it would be very interesting. It would make for a cool story uh, if, if somehow that came to be. Yeah, absolutely. And look, it depends. I think opinions are all over the place on Michael Penix, right? If you look at the consensus board where, you know, Arif Hassan does a good job compiling uh, about 75 different draft people and they, you know, put their – he compiles all of their rankings. He's like the 36th or 37th player. You know, to think of that guy getting picked in the top 10, that's, that's a big leap. Yeah. It's a very big leap. And, you know, I agree with you. I think Neighbors fits the prototype of what Brian Dable wants in a wide receiver. But I do think Roma Dunze completes that wide receiver room a little bit more. Agreed. You have Wando Robinson inside, who is a little bit of a yak guy, not to the same level as Neighbors athletically with size and speed and all that stuff. You already have Hyatt, the speed guy outside. He can be your, your vertical threat. But they don't have that, that big, tall guy that can win with physical play, can contest and catch, but is still fast enough to, to, to separate enough to get open and make plays to give Daniel Jones a big, reliable target. And I think in terms of completing that room, the analogy I've used, Art, is you have a room, right? You got like a really nice lamp over here. You got a nice <laughs> DOS vase. You got a nice accent wall. But you're missing that one piece to bring the room together. The big right. couch you're putting in the middle of the room. Right. Odunze's the, the couch. Sectional. He's right. what makes everything in the room work. He's and the that. sectional with the recliner. You can put your drink. Yeah, and everything it matches everything else right. they already have in the room. So I, I think he does match the guys they have. But I do think neighbor's explosiveness would certainly uh, be something that would appeal to Brian Dable and the types of wide receivers he likes. You know, it, it's... It's one of those things where I think back to last year when we were here, and this is the second straight year we've done our live show from the draft party. We're in the Mezzanine Club now, so if you're a season ticket holder and you're watching, come on by. We're here. We thank some of the fans who have already started to gather here. Doors opened at, at 6. We'll have a, uh, a fan Q&A in a little bit. We're actually waiting on Bobby Okereke. He'll be here, so we don't want to start bringing guys on. Uh, before Bobby gets here. We're just going to have him for a couple minutes. Want to kind of get his 
recollections, his memories from when he was in the draft, third round pick for Indianapolis. Uh, so that should be fun. And we'll get a little bit, little snippet. They've been together for about two weeks now for the offseason program. So maybe we can get something on Shane Bowen's defense and where they're fit. So I got something. Jeremy Fowler from ESPN tweeted this out. Asking around, pretty much clear that much of the top 10 is at least moderately open for business on a potential trade back. This is how he phrases it. Patriots at three open, Cardinals at four open, five Chargers, seven eleven open. So that means <laughs> extremely open. Titans willing to listen, soft open. Falcons open, Bears open, and Jets soft open at ten. So, and you notice who was not included in that list. Uh, it's like the one team that wasn't between three and ten. Every team was mentioned except for the right. Giants at six. Right. By the way, the only way the Giants are open is if the Giants can't move up, and then somehow, you know, they want to get more assets from somebody behind them. Maybe if the three wide receivers are all sitting there at six, like we said, the idea of, okay, well, maybe we can move back to eight or nine and still get a Dunzier or neighbors and be in that situation. But you said something off the top that I think is really important here. I, I can't see the Giants moving away from an elite player. And there are three elite non-quarterbacks in this draft. And it's the three receivers. It's Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze. And I can't see the Giants at a position of need. They need that sectional couch in the room to move away from one of those three guys. It's a hard sell for me. I agree. Unless you're somehow picking up a first-round pick from somebody that is going to move from 13 or 14 that they need to get into the top 10 and they're desperate enough to move in and give you a first rounder for next year because again it really comes down to we know the Giants have done the homework at quarterback you know we know Daniel Jones they want the expect they, they want Daniel Jones ideally to start the season as their number one quarterback have the whatever rookie they bring in come along slowly maybe even red shirt for the year but kind of treat the Giants the way Daniel Jones did when he was a rookie and Eli was here. If the guy is ready to play, he's going to come in. If the team is losing, he's going to come in. If not, they're just going to ride it out with Daniel and then see what they have to do after the season. Now, you and I were talking about this off, so we might as well talk about it now. Yeah. The comfort level, because some fans, are, you know, look, the to me, at least the vocal Giants fan base, and I don't know how everyone feels in here, but there is a definite split in terms of fans who believe that Daniel Jones still needs an opportunity with a better offensive line, better weapons to be able to show what he can do. And then there's a, another segment of the fan base that is done, feels like they need to get a, another quarterback and get another elite quarterback. Oh, this is basically Captain America's Civil War in the fan base. Yeah, well, you know I love is. that, John. I know it's, you do. You know, I, you know <laughs> we're just trying to figure out where Ant-Man sides you know, at this point. Um, you know, but I, I really think that, you know, they're not going to know until they're told definitively the Patriots are out. That, that I think they're legitimately, the Giants, to me, Drake May is the guy that they want to trade up for. And I don't know if Drake May is a guy that they can't get, then where does J.J. McCarthy fall in that, you know, in that circle of players that they're considering? Do they want to move up for J.J. McCarthy at four or at five or at six? Or is J.J. McCarthy a player that they like, but they just don't like enough ahead of the wide receivers, and they're going to go for the wide receivers? Well, how about this? Interesting. What, what if they get to six, McCarthy's there. To your point, they don't like him enough at six, and they get a big offer from the Vikings. And they yeah. can get those two first-round picks in exchange. Right. And in 11, you mentioned the premium players. I would be willing to slide Brock Bowers into that list. I think he's that good of a player. I understand tight ends less valuable than wide receiver, and I would pick the three wide receivers ahead of him. But if at 11, maybe you, if you want to slide back a couple spots maybe right. to, to assure yourself to get one of these guys, that is the only way to me trading down would be a, a potential prospect if you can get those two picks from the Vikings. Um, but look, to your point, you're right. I don't see them trading away. They know – Brian Dable knows, Art, that they need a big piece on offense here. Like, yeah. last year they couldn't score any points. They threw a lot of numbers at the offensive line to try to shore that up to avoid the issue that last year when everyone's hurt and they couldn't get anything done, right? And they lost Saquon Barkley. Darren Waller's up in the air. And now you have to figure out how to score points. 
and yeah. you score points by getting dynamic playmakers. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, at this point, it's a, it's a tough sell of what they're going to do, but we've got, we've got our guest, one of the captains on this team. we got a dynamic playmaker on defense there right he here. Is. All right, what's up, baby? Bobby O'Carrick. What's up, Bobby? What's up, my guy? You good? All right. Sure. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you coming in. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem, man. Uh, wanted to, oh yeah, if you can, yep. there you go. Testing, testing. Uh, wanted to talk to you first off. Welcome. I know you're, you're here. I'm sure the fans. How about a hand for Bobby O'Karake? <laughs> Outstanding free agent brought in last year. Really the crown jewel, I think, of of this regime right now, Bobby Okereke and what you were able to do last year. Wanted to take you back a little bit, because you, you know, it's draft night. We know, you know what it's like to not go on night one. Yep. Still become a star in this league. Take us back to your draft experience. What do you remember from your draft experience? What was that like? Uh, I just remember all my family being with me. Um, it was an exciting couple days leading up to it. Uh, you know, talking to my agent, he was telling me, you know, we expect you to go from rounds two to four. So in my mind, all I heard was two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, the draft unfolded, um, ended up getting drafted in the third round, 89th pick. Um, and when I got that phone call, you know, my whole living room erupted. My family was cheering. Uh, everybody was screaming. I was like, Shh, I got I to gotta hear the phone. Um, but it was just a very powerful memory for me and one I very much enjoyed. So now it was when you were drafted by the Colts, obviously, and then you come here to the Giants. I, I went back and I watched your draft and the announcement and stuff. People don't realize, I'm sure you remember, he certainly wasn't the media star that he is now or the WWE star, <laughs> but Pat McAfee, former Pro Bowl punter for the Colts, yep. actually announced your pick. Back then, did you know McAfee at all or what he became and just the idea of now, when you think about it, have you ever had any exchanges with him that he, he called your name out? For sure. Uh, I mean, knew he was a former player. Um, but, yeah, the celebrity he's grown to has been uh, tremendous. I mean, he's killing it on podcasts every single day. Um, I mean, he dubbed me as, what, the future Hall of Famer? <laughs> yes, he did. So I got some work to do, but, you know, I run into him every Super Bowl, Radio Row, say what's up, pay my respects. Um, Pat's doing great things for Indiana and just, you know, broadcasting overall. So, Bobby, you've had back in the building now for a little more than a week. Yep. A lot of new faces, both Sir. players. You still have your position coach and linebacker, but a new defensive coordinator and also new strength and conditioning coach, right? Yep. So what has it been trying to get back into the groove here with some different things going on around you in the building? Yeah, it's been amazing. Um, you know, trying to you know build on that growth mindset, um, important for me. So in year six, coming in with a new defensive coordinator, coming in with a new strength coach, um, it's just a whole other onboarding process. I mean, I'm not a rookie. Like, I've been through this rodeo. I, I, know, I know the ropes, but... Uh, it's just kind of new tweaks and new stuff to learn. So that's why I keep myself fresh, stay with the growth mindset, just keep learning because I just want to keep elevating my game. But talk a little bit about the idea of, you know, this time of year. It's a weird night because the veterans, I don't know how much you guys pay attention to the draft, who we take in. No, it's probably, you know, probably hit or miss, right? There's probably some guys who are really into it, and then there are other guys who are like, all right, we'll see when they show up in two weeks, that kind of thing. Yep. How do you explain the draft to you know, people when they wonder about the existing team versus the younger guys that are going to be coming in? Do you watch which guys are coming in? Do you think about guys? Okay, how is that guy going to fit in this team? Um, for sure. I mean, we have a lot of trust in our front office and uh, Joe Shane and uh, Dave's. Uh, they're going to make the best decision from a personnel standpoint. Uh, and we all embrace it. You know, this is the NFL. Uh, the nature of the beast is that you're going to compete every single day. Uh, we tell ourselves competition breeds excellence. So uh, we're excited for these new guys to come in, bring some new life, some new energy, um, and really just add some more competition to the field because that's what's going to make us perform great on Sundays. When it comes to rookies coming in, Bobby, I think a lot of times, especially for the higher picks, fan expect these guys to hit the ground and starter, boom, Pro Bowl, boom. Can you just explain exactly how hard it is for a rookie to come in and contribute right away? Yeah, uh, it's very tough. Um, it takes physical, mental, uh, spiritual maturity. Um, I mean, when you go to the college game and you're playing, what, 11, 12 games in a year and you come to the NFL, you're playing 17 plus playoff games. Uh, it's and preseason. And preseason. <laughs> it's a lot of wear and tear on your body. 
Um, you're no longer playing with 17 to 21 year olds. You're playing with 21 year olds to 35 year olds. You're playing with grown men. So uh, for a rookie to come in and you know be very productive, it takes a lot of maturity. But uh, just you know, a kid who's going to come and compete. Last one for me, and thank you for joining us. If you had to talk to the fans here, talk to the audience, what should they expect? I know it's only been about a week and a half, but what should they expect from the Giants defensively this year? Uh, a lot of physicality, a lot of violence, and guys just flying around. We added Brian Burns. Shane Bowen is a great addition for us as a defensive coordinator. Um, our unit is only stronger and stronger. Obviously, Dex, Kayvon, me, Micah, Deontay, Jason Pinnock. Um, you got guys all over the board, so uh, just expect for a big jump in year two. Is the Bowen stuff a little similar to what the stuff you did in Indy? It seems like some of the stuff would be a little bit similar, right? Yeah, a little similar. I mean, um, it's not the wink blitz style for <laughs> sure, but um, a little similar. Um, yeah, we're kind of growing and growing in that process, so I'm excited to learn. Awesome. Bobby Okereke again. Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks for taking the time to come with us. I appreciate it, Bobby. Yes, sir. See you in a couple of weeks. Peace. All right, so Bobby's here. Thanks to Bobby again. Thanks to Ethan from the Giants for making it happen. E Appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we got a nice crowd here with the fans. Darnay Holmes also here. Darnay, back. Hey. Um, so, John, let's get back to just kind of reset a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you have to head to your work soon, so we're going to... Final thoughts uh, here. I'm going to let you go. Yes. Let's go final thoughts, yes. and then I'll start bringing in some fans yes. for some Q&A. Um, you go back, you go back to the building. What are you thinking right now in terms of what am I going to have for do? dinner? That's the first thing yeah. on my thought. Um, no, look, I think you go back and you wait. I think we're all waiting. I think the Giants front office is waiting. All the hay's in the barn. You know, to yep. your point, I don't know what trade offers are out there, what they're waiting on, what they still have to do, but you're just waiting for your time to come up. I mean, you've done all the work. I think you're ready to go in and, and make some picks. And you got to see if you get the phone call you need. You do what you can. And I think it's important to, to move on emotionally. If you're the front office, if you miss out on an opportunity through no fault of your own, to just quickly move on. And the way I'm viewing this art is that I just find it hard to believe that the Patriots in this situation are going to trade off of a quarterback. That's been my thought since the beginning of this process. And for those of you that have listened to our content, you know, I'm, I, I, Drake May is my second quarterback in this draft. I think he's great. Uh, I also think two things can be true. You can think that Drake May is really good. You could also think that Daniel Jones has been put in a really tough spot. And he yep. and last sure. year, it was a really tough situation for him. And I still think he can be a good NFL quarterback. Those two thoughts, believe it or not, can exist at exactly the same time, um, <laughs> which some people don't seem to realize. But And I, I'll leave with this, because I've said this a million times on our other programming. Whether or not you draft a quarterback here, Art, should have nothing to do with what you think of Daniel Jones. Yeah, it should have everything right. to do with what you think about the guy you're going to draft. That's what matters. If you think this guy is going to be a, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, Trevor Lawrence, Joe Burrow level quarterback, you owe it to yourself and the organization to, to make that move. Even if you still think Daniel Jones is a really good quarterback. And remember, 14 months ago, Art, they gave this guy a lot of money. I don't think opinions went 180 on this guy in a span of 14 months. That's not right. how the front office works. So. That's the bottom line. If you believe in the quarterback, you go and you get him. And Joe Shane has basically said as much to us publicly at press conference and such. So I think you wait and you see. You hope the Patriots are, if, if you're a fan that wants that to happen, you hope the Patriots are cooperative. And if they're not, you just go pick the best player. Just don't go into this draft saying, oh, if they, if they, if they, if they don't get a quarterback, it's a disappointment. Because then that's not the right way to approach these things. That's how you draft bad players. And that's how I, I hope fans are viewing it that way. Because the Giants in a lot of ways, do not control their own destiny in this situation. Right. They're a slave to what other teams want to do and are what they're going to allow the Giants to do. And you make the best decision you can with your pick at six based on the cost of moving up, who's available at six when you pick. You make the best pick you can in your particular situation and knock on wood, you hope it works out. All right, two things from you before you go. Yes. One, I want you to tell everyone where they could find you the next three days yeah and then i want you to give me your pick absolutely so uh you can find us live uh when the giants make each one of their picks uh, tonight we'll be live on giants.com giants youtube channel same on friday uh saturday we'll go live at noon so make sure you go check that out uh we'll also have our usual big blue kickoff live episodes at 12 30 tomorrow as well um so that's where you can find all the stuff that we're doing in terms of the pick art 
Look, I've been saying this for a long time. It's just my, my gut tells me Malik Neighbors. It's what my gut tells me. Uh, I think he's the type of wide receiver that this team would like. I think he'll be there at six, and my gut tells me he'll be the pick. Wouldn't shock me if it was Harrison. Wouldn't shock me if they worked the trade for a QB. Wouldn't shock me if it was a Dunze either. Uh, but I'll say Malik Neighbors. John Schmelk, thanks for joining me. Second straight year. Great job, man. Happy to do it, Art. Check out John's stuff on Giants.com. All of his hot... All of his podcasts are great, great draft content, and uh, like, honestly, you know, a lot of people look at in-house content and worry that, ah, oh, it's going to be slanted towards the Giants. John is as good as it gets. John does great stuff and does a great job on Giants.com. So let's reset. I'm Art Stapleton. If you're watching, you probably know that already. This is our all-in live episode from... The Giants draft party here at MetLife Stadium. We are looking at, uh, it's around 6.36. So draft kicks off at 8. We are going to go probably for another half hour or so. But our next guests, or at least the next segment, we are going to do fan Q&A. Now, we have several people who committed to coming tonight and confirmed with me that they were coming. So I want to make sure to get them first before, uh, you know, but we've got time. Everybody's going to get a chance. So who's first up? Bring them on over. How you doing, man? Good, how are you? Good, good. Uh, Who are you? Sanjay Corona. Sanjay Corona, Sanjay, what's up? Sanjay from Somerset County, right? That's right. Giants fan since the 80s. Uh, your first Giants game, you told me a funny story. I want you to tell everybody that. Yeah, that, that's actually uh, really what drove me to become a season ticket holder. It was back uh, in Eli's first year against the Denver Broncos here in Giants Stadium. My brother got tickets. It was my first ever live Giants game. We were sitting up in the 300 section in a cold, cold November, I'll say that. And uh, I remember Eli's fourth quarter comeback, one of his first, just connecting with Imani that whole drive. And at the end, when we, when we scored the winning touchdown, I remember just hugging all the fans around me. And right there, I knew it was like, one day when I can afford season tickets, I'm going to get them. And I was able to. When did you become a season ticket holder? Uh, this is my third season as a season ticket holder. Third season. So yeah. you got one playoff year. Yep. Out of the three years. <laughs> uh, you're hoping for two, I would imagine. Let, let, let's see what happens. You have your Eli jersey Absolutely. on now 20 years ago. Yeah was yesterday was when the Giants made the trade for Eli Manning. What's your sense going into the draft? What are you thinking? And you have any questions for me about where the team is at? Yeah, so I, I mean, I really think that depends on what the Patriots do, what you said there. After three, we'll know what I think what the Giants are going to do. And I, I really think they're still going to go wide receiver on this pick. I really do. I think my question becomes this. I think everyone took that J.J. McCarthy interview like a bit of a shock yesterday, right? Yeah. Do you think in a cynical sense maybe it was a false flag in the sense of like he's telling the Vikings like, hey guys, if you want me, the Giants are going to take me at six. You better start calling the Cardinals or the Chargers and start making a deal for me. That's a very interesting point. And Sanjay, as you know, <laughs> that happens this time of year. Guys yeah. are sending out messages. Uh, here's the one thing I know. Rich, it was on the Rich Eisen Show, J.J. McCarthy. If you haven't seen the video, really talk glowingly about the Giants. Rich had asked him about you know, which team he thought he was going to go to. And you talked about the Giants. Yep. Talked about Coach Dable and Mr. Shane and Coach Coach Shea, Coach Shea Tierney, the quarterback's yep. coach, pass game coordinator, Mike Kafka, he mentioned. So if you just take that at face value, you'd say, man, he, he really is connected with the Giants. But I, I, I agree with you. It wouldn't surprise me. I think there was a comfort level, though, for him because Rich Eisen is a Michigan guy. And obviously, J.J. being from Michigan, yep. uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he just got very comfortable in that setting and just kind of let himself go and was honest and didn't realize he was sending that kind of message. So we'll see. But I do appreciate it. So who's your pick if they go wide receiver? Uh, I think if Marvin Harrison's there, they're definitely going Marvin Harrison Jr. You can't, you can't take away from talent like that. A guy's going to be who could change your entire offense just on uh, stretching the field. I agree with you, but if, I think if Marvin is going to be there, has to go four quarterbacks, and that means the Giants get shut out of the quarterbacks. So it's going to be a little bit of a divide, I think. I mentioned it earlier on the fans and what, 
what people are actually expecting at this point. I think you can't go wrong with any of the three, though. I think either way they're going to contribute, and I think they're going to help whoever the quarterback is for the season become a better high-scoring offense as far as I'm concerned. Awesome. Sanjay, thank, thank you. you for coming on. Appreciate yeah. it. Let's give a hand to Sanjay. Grab a football, grab a koozie, all in, all in stickers. Thank you for coming on. Do we have anybody else who is committed beforehand? You came? Not Andrew Thomas, but nice like the jersey. A little too small. Yeah. What, you doing, what's your name? Jake de Blasio. Oh, okay, what's up, Jake? How you doing, man? I'm all right. How are you? Good, good. Jake is uh, 20 years old, a big-time offensive lineman for Del Valve, Delaware Valley University, Division Three, nationally ranked football program. So, you know, you making that bid for right tackle or what? You know, coming into this process, I was. Coming into this process, I was, but we've made so many investments into the old line this offseason, and not just the guys we signed like Illuminor and Runyon, we also brought in our new coach. So I think that's a huge upgrade, and that's, I think, going to put us over the top on the old line compared to how it's been in years past. And now we can look to address receiver or quarterback, whatever kind of falls into our lap. So I, one thing you told me, and when it, the guys who committed – and said they were coming. I wanted to exchange emails a little bit, get a little background on, on you guys for when you come on the show. One thing I thought was interesting is they, you know, you're 20 years old, so you're a Giants fan. You've caught the end of you know, the, the big time run you know, back, back when you really first started rooting for the team, I guess taking it seriously. But as far as the 80s back in Super Bowl 21 and 25, basically a myth for you, right? A legend. I thought what was great is you said uh, was it your dad who turned you on to LT highlights on YouTube? Tell me what that was all about. Yeah, I got to give a big shout out to my dad. He's he's the reason I'm the Giants fan I am today, and everything I have is a credit to him. And I mean, it, it's a cool story. I got to meet Lawrence Taylor when I was nine years old. Wow. And I remember I uh, broke my iPhone. We went to the mall. <laughs> we saw a Lawrence Taylor helmet, and I didn't have enough. And my dad made me work for it, doing chores around the house. We go to buy the helmet. We find out he's like two weeks later, he's coming in to sign an autograph. So we got to meet him. So I got to meet the man, the myth, the legend, and just kind of really learn about that 80s. And those all our Super Bowls really come from strong defenses. So I think, too, getting to learn the history of this team is really kind of made me change how like I think about this team and why we can get back to the Super Bowl runs that we're, we used you're, to have. You're an interesting age group for this for this fan base because I think, you know, you like I said, you came right on the heels of right Super Bowl 42 and 46. 42, were you even born? What were you? I'm trying to remember, thinking back. I was three years old. Yeah, so 42 was basically a YouTube highlight for you. Yeah. And then 46, you kind of remember, I would imagine, a little bit. Yeah, I that, that was a big game for my family because my mom's a Patriots fan. Oh. And I, I just remember the rivalry building up and doing a little bit of trash talking and came out on top. So I, I remember I fell asleep before halftime, but I remember a little <laughs> bit of the game. So what, are you an eight? At I was the time? eight, yeah. Uh, that's forgivable. I mean, you know, you'll stay up for tonight to watch the draft. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, just, Let's talk about, like I mentioned the age group, I and mean, it's a very interesting thing because the Giants fan base was always viewed as, you know, the, the older fan base, older, older fans who remember the days of going to Yankee Stadium, and then it was the old Giants Stadium, uh, and then the younger fan base has seen a lot of losing, you know, let's be honest. Um, for you, you're here with an Andrew Thomas jersey, obviously one of the best things to happen to this franchise in the last 10 years is the selection of Andrew Thomas. Now he's signed right up until 2029. I mentioned to Bobby Karake when he was here earlier, he was one of the crown jewels of this regime with Joe Shane and Brian Dable. Well, Andrew Thomas getting him signed to an extension to be here until 2029, it almost gives the younger fan base one of the, f one of the players here that you could actually latch on to. But what's your feeling for where this team is right now? And is it frustrating? You know, it's a social media age. It's a lot different than what fans had it. When your dad started rooting for the Giants, it's a different world. What's it like being a 20-year-old Giants fan that hasn't seen a bunch of winning? Obviously, it's tough. I mean, 2022 was a great year for me. I mean, just seeing all that, I mean, 
made me really happy. And obviously last year was a down year, but we still have some good, really young pieces, hoping Evan Neal can bounce back with a new offensive line coach. Tay Banks flashed last year. Now he's going to be in a new system. Kayvon hit double-digit sacks. So I really trust Coach Dayball. I think seeing what he did in Buffalo with Josh Allen, I, I have a lot of faith in him and Joe Shane. So it's a little frustrating right now, but I do feel optimistic for the future, which was something I never really felt in the Gettleman era. I always felt like we were going to be stuck where we were. But seeing the new regime, they give me hope. Which is interesting because, you know, one of the players that Dave Gettleman at least could, you know, take a little bit of credit for is the guy that you're repping right now with your jersey. So understood. I understand that pattern. Hey, look, sometimes general managers get lucky. You know, sometimes you get lucky. You, and I've written the idea of how, you know, it's process versus results. If the process is good, the results will ultimately work out at some point. The, one of the reasons why Joe Shane is general manager is because the process wasn't great under the last regime and the last coaching staff, and I think that's kind of how it ended up happening. So before we let you go out and enjoy the draft party, it is the draft. The Giants are sitting at six. You mentioned your mom is a Patriots fan. Patriots hold the keys a little bit to some of what the Giants are trying to do here. What do you want to see happen tonight for the Giants in this draft? Give up whatever they have to to get Drake May at three. I'm, that's what I want. I, I have a feeling they're going to trade up. I know, my mind, my heart tells me that, but I know deep down it's probably going to be Neighbors or Odunze at six when it comes down to it at the end. Do you have a preference for, for one of those guys? I started off a Malik Neighbors fan. I'm starting to transition to Odunze a little bit. You're, you're, he's winning you over by what he did at the Combine, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. That, that, that three cone, and then we mentioned it earlier, the idea that Roma Dunze stayed after his testing was done, and he ran the three cone drill again and again because he was unhappy with the time. That was pretty funny. But listen, Jake, thanks for joining me. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the night, and keep on keeping on. We'll keep listening all in, and we appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Art. Appreciate Thanks a lot, it. Jake. Jake de Blasio. All right, we're here at the Mezzanine Club, MetLife Stadium. We are sitting at this point. It is 647, so we're going to try to hang out a little bit longer. We've got the draft starting off at 8. Uh, appreciate all the fans here, season ticket holders, hanging out, listening a little bit of the show. Appreciate everyone who's home, watching on YouTube, my family, give a little... Hello to my family back home watching the game, watching the show here. Um, I don't know if we have any other fans that that uh, confirmed to be here. If anybody's here, we got somebody else here. So come on, come on in, and we'll talk about it. How's it going, man? Michael, nice to meet you. Michael, nice to meet you too. Michael's here. Let me. I gotta go to my notes. Michael, you were you were uh, you have an experience and a history in media, hosting radio, right? Yeah, correct. I. Uh... I was on a sports radio talk program at Centenary University a little while ago at this point, but awesome. it's nice to kind of be back here again. So how'd you become a Giants fan? Uh, I didn't have any choice. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Giants Super Bowl in 2000. Uh, my favorite animal at that point was a dolphin. I had a Dolphins jersey. <laughs> that was uh, the last time that I probably wore that jersey with my grandparents. They, they put an end to that. Started taking me to Giant games around that same time. and. Uh, season tickets have been in my family forever, even dating back to the old stadium and everything. So, uh, never really had a choice. <laughs> yeah, you know what? And now that I'm looking at, at the stuff you sent me, I thought it was a great background story. The idea that your grandparents had season tickets for their three daughters. I assume one of the daughters was your mom. Is my mom, yeah. Yep. So, 10 total tickets at the old stadium. And then you end up inheriting, obviously, you know, memories for your for your grandparents obviously you know condolences for their passing yeah. and then they pass it on to you that's got to be a great honor to kind of represent your family as a season ticket holder yeah absolutely it's incredible to be able to do cool things like this get to interact with you get to go on the field in the locker room um you, you know share not so recently good memories about yeah. some of the games that have been played but uh experiences that i'll never forget and it's always been about family tailgating and then going to enjoy the game afterwards now i know you're a big villanova knicks fan <laughs> i know Nick, you're a big fan of the three villanova guys 
uh, got the game tonight. How are you going to handle this? What are you going to do? <laughs> I got to imagine they'll put it on a TV uh, somewhere, the Knicks game. I'm certainly hoping so. It looks like a lot of the, the TVs are dedicated to the draft right now. Hopefully one of those switches over to, to MSG or ESPN for the, for the Knicks game tonight. Uh, in Philly, it's going to be interesting. The last game was unbelievable. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. They're not just going to lay over, I don't think, uh, the 76ers. So. Uh, tell me the story you mentioned about Kerry Collins. Yeah, so um, my dad and I were going to one of the games. I, I was too little to remember which one it was, but uh, we were over where the players were coming into to the stadium, and um, my dad always told me, you know, if you're looking for autographs, things like that, always be respectful. They don't owe you anything, so just hold your football out. If they, they sign it, great. If not, no big deal. Um, Kerry Collins came in, didn't really sign for anybody, uh, walked right past me, and, you know, I was pretty, pretty bummed. I was probably five years old at the time, six years old, and, um, his wife kind of couldn't hear what they were saying, but started kind of scolding him, and he <laughs> turned back around and patted me on the head and signed my football, and uh, that's a memory that I'll never forget. Nice. Well, Kerry's Car a good dude. <laughs> Came back for that, and hey, uh, take it from me, I'm sure <laughs> always listen to the wife. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course, of course. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Uh, last thing before I let you go, draft, what are you thinking tonight? What do you hope they do at number six? Well, I, I mean, I know what I hope they do, but I think in reality that doesn't really matter. Uh, I think Brian Dable and Joe Shane have to have conviction about whoever they're picking. If it's trading up for, for Drake May at three overall, which we've heard reports of, I, I think they have, need to have conviction of it, that that's their guy and they're, they're going to live or die by that pick and that'll define their, their history here. So um, ideally what I'd like them to do, I think one of the receivers makes a lot of sense. I'm partial to Odunze. Uh, I wouldn't mind Neighbors either or Harrison, but I think Odunze schematically and, and kind of uh, some of the characteristics that Giants the Giants ownership have looked for in the past. You saw the combine stuff with him staying afterwards. Yep. Those are the intangibles that this franchise really seems to love. So. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming by, you know, again, to all the fans who have come by. You know, you got great stories. I love hearing from Giants fans about how they became fans and especially the different generations of fans, I think, is great. So, Michael, thanks for coming, coming no, on. I appreciate thank you. It. Thanks for doing this, Art. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. All right. So, so we are here. We're coming up on an hour to go before the draft begins. Uh, Again, thanks to John Schmelk, Bobby O'Karake was here earlier, Darnay Holmes in the audience, all the fans kind of swinging by, hearing some guy talk, saying, what are they, what are they doing over there? What's the deal? What's going on? So, um, you know, I think, you know, they, you have to look at this draft in several ways, and it's kind of in segments. Tonight is his own segment, and what happens tonight will really determine what happens tomorrow and then on Saturday because the latest I've heard as far as the draft compensation to get up to three as we talked about with John Schmelk earlier was a flip of three and six and then the second round pick today and then a future first round pick that's the starting point for the Patriots to get them to bite to go up and get Drake May and I'm not sure if that's gonna happen uh, but we'll have to see I, what do I think I think I make the play if I can do it. I go up and get Drake May. If I don't, then it's going to be very interesting to see what happens uh, at six. Uh, so we'll see what happens. All right, we got uh, got another fan. Cool. Hi, how are you? Getting into yeah, broadcasting. Nice to meet you. I'm What's Carly. You nice to meet you. Carly? Yeah. Where are you from, Carly? North Caldwell, New Jersey. Okay, North Caldwell. Yeah. How old are you? What year I'm are you? 16. I'm going to be a sophomore. Wow. Yeah. Sophomore. Yeah. You go to Caldwell High School? West Essex. West Essex. Cool. I covered high schools for a long time. Yeah. So West Essex was always very mm -hmm. good. Very good in football. I, f I follow you on Twitter, and it's so nice to read all your oh, stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for following me on Twitter. Thanks mm -hmm. for being a part of the show. What do you think? Uh, what so, do you think for tonight? I'm really nervous because I feel like the Giants can either be like so, they can be so unpredictable at some parts. And when you look at Daniel Jones and all that he's done, you see some really good trends with him and then you can see some really bad trends with him as we saw last year. And so my problem is, is that if we draft this star wide receiver, like we had hope that Jalen Hyatt could become a star, but yet we couldn't get him the ball. If we draft a star wide receiver without having that quarterback that can throw them the ball, what's the 
what's the like what's the motivation behind it that we know that this player is going to be a star that like they say Malik Neighbors oh he's going to be the next Tyreek Hill but if he if he can't get the ball how are we supposed to how are we supposed to show off his talent yeah it's a it's a great point I mean it's a chicken and egg thing mm -hmm. right it's the idea of you want the great quarterback who's going to make everybody better. We all saw what Eli Manning did. You're still on the younger age. Well, yeah. you caught Eli's yeah. tail end of his career. The idea of making players better around him uh, when, you know, they went and won Super Bowls. He had talent. Mm -hmm. Do you need the offensive line before you get a quarterback? Mm -hmm. Do you need the wide receivers before you go get a quarterback? Or do you get the quarterback and then you build around him? Mm -hmm. It's a great point about, you know, the receivers. I, I think... At this point, it's a tough call. You just have to get the player, right? Yeah. You just have to worry about getting the talented player and then after that, build around that player. And mm. if that player is the wide receiver, if that player is the quarterback, you just have to take the opportunity because this time last year, they were picking at 25. Now, they made a great pick. They moved up. I think Tay Banks is a very good pick. I agree. Uh, but... You know, a year later, now you're picking in the top 10. Mm -hmm. You didn't anticipate that. They don't want to be picking in the top 10 again next year. So that's where it is. Uh, you have Kayvon Thibodeau's jersey yeah. on. What, what's your sense for this defense? How excited I'm were you? I'm so doing? excited when they signed Brian Birds, especially to a great deal after Carolina, like, gave up that option with the Rams, and I thought that the Giants, like, executed it very well. And I think that the front line with Dexter Lawrence and Kayvon, like, it's going to be strong, and I think that the Giants struggled with that last year. Like, Kayvon has so much talent, yet we would, I would always watch, and I'd be like, is he going to go sack the quarterback, and he couldn't get there? And I like how, like, they're building this defensive line to – be stronger to get to the quarterback. Now, talk, tell me about this because, you know, five, even five years ago, the idea of you're a young woman, you want to be in this business, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure people, you know, if it's 10, 15 years ago, didn't have someone to look at, didn't see football, you know, as a game that could be for, for women. Now the Giants have uh, two female coaches, they have females uh, all over this department, uh, in the football department, and mm -hmm. all over the organization. What does that mean to you? Uh, you know, we hear people talk about that, but what does that influence mean to you as you're trying to, you know, really advance yourself and, and be a part of this game? So that's something, like, really, like, that I'm passionate about, about how, yeah, like, it's a very, like, a lot, there's, it's, football is like a male generated sport and how there's getting more and more girls involved and I think that's a great thing because I started coming to the Giants games when I was little and I've become this huge fan and I think that it's important that like I always say to the boys at school like oh like what do you think about the draft yet no one really cares about my opinion so seeing that females are getting more and more involved in this league is like super important to me because it just shows that like there's leaders and there's mentors for me as I continue to aspire to like become a reporter and become a part of like this job. That's awesome. Well, listen, the Giants have a great uh, female reporter yeah. as well, Madeline Burke. I don't know if you've ever yeah. met her, but she's great. She's accessible. I would reach out to her. Yeah. If not, thank you him. follow me. Reach yes. out to me if you haven't. I'll try to hook oh, you up thank with you. Madeline. And, yeah. um, you know, we'll talk. But thanks for coming on. Yeah. Carly, everybody. Thank you. Nice, nice to meet you. Thank you. Great job. You know, the, the future generation of fans, you know, I, I know my daughter loves the Giants. Uh, our producer, Paul Wood, his daughter loves the Giants, although I think she's a little angry with the Giants right now. Paul's daughter, after Saquon, ends up leaving and going to Philly. Uh, that's pretty. Has, has Emma gotten over Saquon going to Philly or no? Who changed the dog's name? The dog's name has changed from Barkley. Yes, yes. What? Name, Thor. Thor? Yes. <laughs> Is that for, for Syndergaard? Or? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's... It's an interesting transition year for the Giants to not have Saquon Barkley here. Uh, Xavier McKinney's not here, but I think, um, you know, they're moving in a direction that, you know, it seems to me that the fans are happy, but tonight, I don't know what makes every fan happy tonight. It's a, it's a tough call. I think maybe Marvin Harrison Jr., if he's at six, that the Giants, if they take him there, uh, maybe most fans will be, but... Uh, we're going to bring in another fan here. This is a repeat guest from last year. And uh, the Giant Singh joined us last year, and he's back again this year. How's it going on? How are you? What's Good going on? How much? Jasmine, 
you were great last year. We had a lot, you know, a lot of fun. You had some good yep. questions. So, what's on your mind now? We're you know going into tonight. Um, everyone's talking about we need a new quarterback. We need a new quarterback, right? But what I think is like we actually need a stud wide receiver. Okay. Um, so I mean I don't know where we're we gonna get it or how we're we gonna get it, but we have to get at least a wide receiver one to try. Yeah. You know. Because we haven't had one in a decade since OBJ left. You name a wide receiver that has actually stepped up. Or we found one. Talk a little into the mic. There or we go. found one that, that has actually stepped up and be a wide receiver one. Right. So I always see there, there's always a gap there. So we should go and get wide receiver one who can, who can rock the stadium. Well, you got three wide receivers there in, in the top ten. At this point, will be interesting to see if the Giants stay at six. Uh, do you have a favorite out of the three? Malik Neighbors. Malik Neighbors. Why? What do you like about Neighbors' game? It's just he's explosive. He's uh, he just reminds me of OBJ. That's wow. it. He's 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 tall. He's I mean, yeah, he can catch the ball. But like I was talk, I was I was having the same conversation with one of my other friends at the tailgate party, and he was like, if we find a wide receiver, then do we need a person to actually throw it to him? I'm like, yeah, but at least we can try, you know? Right. I mean, Daniel Jones, is, it's a very difficult situation with him. Like, yeah. You know, especially with his injuries now, piling up, not even one, he had three injuries, right? Three, I think three or four injuries, right? That he, had, he has had for the last couple of years. So him being a long-term quarterback is probably not an answer. Yeah. So yes, we do need a quarterback, but before that, we actually need a wide receiver. Well, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what they do. We do appreciate it. All of a sudden, they decided to turn the, the volume up. So it's the best we could do. So we apologize for everyone who's watching at YouTube, for people in here who might not be able to hear us, try to talk as loud as we can. Um, so, you know, you last year, uh, you added to the family last year after, right? After the draft party, right? Last summer, it was a newborn last summer right i had yes no i thought you did it was it was last summer yes yeah. you're right you're right yeah. so I he's turning seen. no you're right you're right Turn I'm, what? i blacked out he's turning one in i next. shouldn't know your family better than you do come he's on i'm sorry <laughs> he's turning he's actually turning one on 17th of may Got next you. month so awesome 15 well, more days yeah happy birthday to your son Thank and you. obviously um, you know, you're a great fan. It's always great to see you. Thank you. And uh, thanks for coming by. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep, definitely. The Giants sing. Always good sing. All right, I think we, I think we got the message right that we're probably, probably should wrap it up soon. Everybody's gonna try to get ready. The Knicks are on. Who's gonna, who's gonna try to take a peek at the Knicks at this point? Go Knicks. Uh, I know, I know. Paul Wood, my producer, is here. But well, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Unfortunately, we got the sound now, so work in progress. We're always trying to, uh, to bring the show to you, the fans. We appreciate the audience. Make sure you check out all my coverage on NorthJersey.com all week, all weekend, always. Uh, check out on social media, Art underscore Stapleton, if you haven't checked me out on X, and obviously the All In Podcast. Make sure you watch some of our shows on YouTube trying to make a push on video and uh that's it so thanks to before we get out i want to thank carrie sydney and maggie from the giants for all the help today uh bobby okereke john schmelk for our northjersey.com crew here thank you for joining us and uh you can catch a replay of this show audio will be up you can watch it on youtube for anybody who was on but my pick tonight before we go, before I lose my voice already. I think the Giants are pulling off a trade. I think Joe Shane's gonna do what he's gotta do. I think it may cost you the 2025 first rounder, but I do think that they are gonna do whatever they can to be aggressive, get up to three with the Patriots. And I think Drake May is gonna be the pick for the Giants tonight. That's my pick. Uh, am I gonna be right? I'm not sure. But I do know that I nailed Tay Banks' pick last year at the draft party. Maybe we can go for two for two. So for everybody here for NorthJersey.com, I'm Art Stapleton. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Everyone, thanks for being here watching the show. And we'll catch you soon. We'll have some uh, reaction podcasts over the weekend.